Intra Modeling and Analysis Group Scale Modeling Consortium webinar series, and my name is Grace Peng, and I am happy to introduce the speakers for today. The first speaker will be Dr. Rick Durkin. He is an assistant professor, uh, assistant research professor at Arizona State University with a research program in neuro and bioinformatics. His focus is the development of approaches and tools to systematically validate computational biology models against a wide range of experimental data and to validation a major part of the model development and model sharing process. And the second speaker is Dr. Parag Gleason, who is a senior postdoc at the University College London and works on infrastructure for building standardizing and sharing models in computational neuroscience. He is a developer of neural construct and is one of the main contributors to the neural ML language for model specification. He's recently been leading the development of the open source brain repository for collaborative model development. I actually had the pleasure of just seeing both of them at a recent conference that um, I organized at Genalia Research Campus called Collaborative Development of Data Driven Models of, the, of Neural Systems that Parag organized with Angus Silver. Um, and so I am pleased to welcome the speakers here today. So I will pass mic on to Rick. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we uh, are speaking together uh, because um, we um, are trying to use each other's tools. He has a much more uh, mature tool that he's going to speak about uh, in, in about 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to lead it off by talking about overarching ideas and then introducing concepts um, and and, model and he's really talking about the collaborative aspect of, of how we how we develop models together as a community. So um, the main concern I have as a as a as a researcher is trying to understand how we get our models right, how trying to model. And then there's sort of two two parts to that. One is is consistency of parameters with the literature. So the, the parameters that you that you set in your models you know, you, you hope that if uh, if some kinds of parameters have been set experimentally, that your 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 model is using those parameters, and and, and not always the case. Uh, the other part is, is predictive power. So when your model makes a prediction, uh, it makes a prediction that can be tested with an experiment or has been tested with an experiment, and you want to check and to see whether the model uh, pretty matches uh, that and and uh, the what was observed in the experiment. And there are really two two sides of of, of model uh, val uh, validity. And uh, we really want to be able to do to both of them. I'm going to talk about how we get parameters uh, that we might uh, put into our models, and, and then, but especially how do we then we test to make sure the model that we have parameterized is making predictions that are in accord with what we observe in reality. Um, here's an example of uh, a model data. This is something that I did about 10 years ago uh, when I was a student. Uh, the, it's not really important what this, this graph is showing. Simply that the the dots represent uh, experimental data, and the black curve represents something contained from, from the model. And it published this as an example of uh, success in our model. Back on this, and I'm really not so sure if or how we would determine whether it's a success. You can see that you know, sort of in general, the model uh, curve captures some stylized features of the data points, but this is just very very uh, informally. And it'd be very hard for anyone to go back and, and try to understand, you know, uh, how not only the model was working, but, but whether it was working at all. So, um, if you're a, 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 you might be like a superposition of data. It's actually quite informal. It's very access, you know, the underlying model and, and, and that went into that. Um, certainly, it would be very hard to reproduce. I mean, I even I made this model, and I, I'm not entirely sure I can reproduce this figure. Um, it's complete, right? There's a number of aspects of the data that we could model. We chose to model this one, uh, maybe in part because this is one of the, the areas that we thought the model would, would shine. So these are all, all problems in, in, in model validation as it, as it currently stands now, now uh, especially in, in, in the literature. Um, well, so we really have something where we can we can work that we can use to validate come to models, you know, more formally. Uh, and, and rigorously to do so, you know, quickly, so it's not a huge burden on the model. Uh, and very transparent about the model. It's very transparent what that claim is, what's exactly being tested, uh, and how that might be reproduced. 
And this is something we want to integrate continuously into model development. So this is not something that you do after the model is finished, but this is something that's going on throughout the cycle of development. Inspiration for, for the approach I took to help to try to solve this problem is from is from software development. Software development is a large project. We have a unit test. And a unit test for those who don't have a, a software development background is um, a little piece of code that is to check that a certain part of the program is working in the expected. So, for example, you might have a, a test to make sure that a that a function uh, which which uh, you know add numbers, for example, is is adding numbers in the way that is expected. Um, that sounds almost trivial, right? Um, you know, why would you do that? Well, to test that it changes two basically. So, so as our as our models get more complex, it's important to to, to try to adopt this. Um, yeah, in, in, and to have basically driven unit tests, where where the unit tests are not sort of checking that the model is, is uh, check that the model is doing what we want it to do. And we want to recapitulate some, some system, so we want a bunch of little tests that test uh, little little aspects of uh, aspects of the model against uh, individual of, of 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 our experimental knowledge of of, of the system. Uh, so uh, let me give this analogy. Essentially, the model that we have is like is like a, a, a function. And it's to the model are kind of experiments. You can run experiments on the model, right? You can do things and see how the model behaves in the simulation. And now some some observations uh, the model makes. Make this more concrete. Uh, let's say the model of and here I'm going to use neuroscience as an example, although this, uh, a lot of this talk is not specific to neuroscience. Uh, here's a particular neuron in C. elegans. And uh, one thing you might do, one uh, experiment you might do to that to that model, simulation experiment, is you might inject current into the soma of that neuron, and then that might be a prediction about what that neuron would do. In this case, the memory potential would change in a certain stereotypical way, showing, showing an actual potential at a certain time. Um, and what you can do is you want to check your same experiment on the model as you do on, on, on the real neuron. And check to, to see if those the predicted uh, uh, output of the model it matches what you record in the experiment. So it's really a very you know simple idea. I think we all we would just want to sort of formalize it. And so the idea is, what if we you know build this collection of, of, of data driven units and and not only test our models with them but characterize the performance of the model according to the suite of tests. How many of these tests does it pass? How often does it do it on in each test? Let's say instead of passing and failing, there's some score that you give it. And you want to ask uh, how, how, how high were these scores? You want to evaluate your models in terms of their performance in these tests. And the idea behind Sci Units. So Sci Unit is a, is a software development library that I uh, help uh, uh, develop. And its, um, its goal is to in a, in a take care of all the disindependent uh, adaptions of this process. So there's nothing about Sci Unit that uh, is specific to, to neurons. Or do any other discipline in science? If all the things that we generally do when we're testing are science trying to take care of, it's trying to uh, take care of all the uh, all things that are common to to scientific model validation. Um, so I'll talk a little more about the details uh, coming up. So very abstract you know, vision of what this might look like. Uh, so this is from, from uh, cosmology. Uh, if you wanted to ask how certain solar cycle models uh, how well they perform, uh, I sort of make people and have uh, uh, three different models uh, shown in the, in, the, in the rows. And you have you might have four different tests. One test might come from each of uh, several different observations of, of the sun. And, uh, and then the scores in the cells of the table are, 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 are how well the model perform on, the, uh, on, on, on each of those. Um, and uh, you may have a suite of tests, which is an ensemble of test average overall the test. And the best model, the model we want to use going forward, uh, we want to develop going forward, is the one that's sort of outperforming the uh, models. Or you might one of the models is performing poorly and say, okay, what can we change about this model to make it perform, uh, have performance that's more in accord with, with what the data is showing us. Um, so your challenges in this approach um, is that you, in modeling, you have a wide range of, of skills, of, of model languages, and of goals of modeling. And um, how do you how do you solve that? So one of the key things to do is, and this is it's again something taken from software development, the idea of separating the implementation from the interface. So how specific 
model is, is imitated, for example, what emulator is used, or you know, what, uh, what the solvers are used, or what kinds of, uh, of, of you know, particular software packages are used in the model, that's not that important. What's important is, is what, what the things can the model do, and we access those things the model can do. So, for example, um, going to the example of somatic current injection, um, if you wanted to inject current into the soma of a model neuron, how would you see your model? It doesn't. It doesn't matter what models you know back in MIT that it is. But if as a as a person wanting to test it, wanted to inject current, what would you need to to to, to call? Um, so you also want to minimize the development time for writing the test. The writing test can be very tedious. It's tedious in normal software development projects, um, where some of the goals are very clear. Um, when it's uh, when you're when you're writing tests for 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 scientific models. That can be quite a lot of work, but that can um, uh, reduce especially by sticking to to standards uh, and using tools that rely on those standards. Where instead of writing having to write different tests for every model, you can write a test for uh, that, that adheres to certain standards, and then that test can be applied to all the models that 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 adhere to that standard. That can save quite a lot of time. And then you know, we might we may all disagree on, on what the right test is. A model, and um, that's where collaborative development really is, is key, right? There's no one person who can say what the right test is, but sort of we can we can we can you know, discuss it and we can produce tests and 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 have you know online uh, collaborative development tools to sort of uh, different suites of tests and also you know integrate them when we have some sort of agreement. So, um, I want to get back to this idea of, of capabilities, which is which is something I talked about in the, in the last slide about you know is that implementation of the interface. So let's um, and this is again a neuron example because that's something most done the most work and this we can run the test and get that active potentials uh, in response to certain experience you run on the model. Um, the test might say well the first thing is I need you the model to soma uh, be able to receive somatic current injection and also to produce active potential. So the model can do that, um, and we can do that. Like this model, this model one, a non-spiking model, I don't even produce that potential. It's some other kind of kind of model. So that model doesn't take the test, right? It's not the kind of model that is relevant to that test. Whereas my model, I can do all, all those things, and the model that can do those things, the implementation for those things, can take the test. So then the the model can then be prepared to to take the test. And so that is, is the kind of work that's being checked. Under the hood in, in science. So, um, finally, you put the format, maybe collect some stylized facts about it and summarize it. You have to, to, to create these tests. You have to be able to, to do all the sort of same things on the modeling side, uh, execute it, pick simulators, and, and, and process the output, and, and so forth. So, it's really very complex. Uh, and I would say 10 years ago, trying to do all this would be especially science, would have been as possible because every step had a hundred different ways that you could do it. Um, in, in physiology, we're, we're slowly converging on a, a several steps to, to a very number of standards. I'm just going to give an example of a few of them here. Um, so, for example, there's uh, experimental data formats. It used to be really no experimental data format that was common to, to, to neurophysiology. Now there's a format called Neurodata Without Borders, or WB, uh, which, which is something that's going to be a large neurophysiology data going forward. Um, for example, it used to be the case that you know you have to uh, maybe mine through a uh, hundred journal articles and, and, and find uh, a bunch of summary statistics and pull them all. That's a lot of work. Now we've reached this, like one of what called neuroelectro org, where they've essentially done all that work of pooling for you. So you can look up any neuron, any other physiological property, and you can get a summary of, of, of data that's been collected about that. And then other, many other example standards here. One of them is for model discovery. Uh, open source brain is an example of place this is we and, 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 and work uh, models that, that, that you might want to test. Um, so for some practical, you still have to, someone still has to do the work of, of, of implementing these domain uh, standards or implementing the interface to the domain standards. And that's part of what, what Neuron Unit is. So Neuron Unit is a project that, that they're working on, and it tries to make the, the job of, of model validation unit with neurophysiology uh, as easy as possible. So it's a collection of, of these uh, uh, interfaces uh, to, to, to demand standards. And uh, I'm going to show in the previous slide is 
is electro.org. So if you get a chance, if you're interested in neurons at all, you might want to give it a go to, go to neuroelectro.org. It's a really cool resource um, that I helped uh, um, some of the tree drive trip with um, a, a few years ago, and he, he's, he's developed it. It text mining the literature, um, extracting you know, individual parameters that you might want to use either to parameterize your model or to uh, test your model. So, for example, a, a recipe potential is something that um, it, it every neuron has, and it's something you might want to put into the model um, is something, you know, it could be a parameter of the model, but it could also be something you observe properties, something you observe in the model. Certainly true of, of spike uh, process of actor potential, like the width of actor potential. That's never a parameter of the model, really. That's something that, that emerges from a model from simulating it. And then you measure it and you test uh, using this using this, this website. You can you can extra data and test uh, whether the model uh, has, has, has matching properties as well. Um, neuron unit makes it easy by using the neural electro API to, to, to extract these properties and to parameterize tests using that and then, and then to run one model. So it's is, 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 is very popular now. These are just some examples of, I think this is from a week of, 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 uh, of, of gets to Neuroelectro. These are some of the countries of, of people uh, that have visited Neuroelectro. So it's something like 70 countries now. So it's an increased popular place to find information on physiology and save off of a deep literature search. Of course, it links back to that literature, so you can you can, you can do the research if you want. All this really is is practical because with tools like GitHub, uh, software uh, development, um, where we can we can put our models, we can put our our, our, our tests, and then we, we can collaborate and develop them. But we can also sort of uh, uh, um, the process of, of discovering the models and testing, executing them, of, you know, automated. Um, so this is an example of what a testing repository might look like. You have some models, you have some tests, you have a list of, of, of capabilities and so on, and there's a few configuration files that I'll, I'll briefly discuss. Um, example of, of sort of um, not exactly the, the, the workflow that I use, but an, an example of what you can do is just sort of make a loop. It over all the models, uh, iterates over all the tests, and it says, okay, test, judge this model, and it prints out a score. Okay, so the, the, the most extremely simple case you could do, um, this, this is an example of this bottom code here is an example of a, of a, of a recapitulation of a paper from, from about six years ago, we sort of did this a long way, right, where they actually, you know, ran you know, all these simulations of, uh, sort of, uh, with considerers and, 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 and with, uh, uh, and different, you know, data and so on. Um, but it actually, is it really just a few lines of code now to, to be able to do this sort of thing again. Um, so, um, where are we applying this? Well, one of is open source brain. I'm, I'm doing, working with with future to to bring testing to to the model. That people human brain project um, in, in in Europe, um, where they have very biophysically detailed models. And um, helping to uh, use to constrain uh, models of neurons and, and ion channels and the small circuits that they have. Another example which I'm going to use going forward is, is OpenWorm. OpenWorm is this, is this really cool uh, um, international project to simulate C. elegans, and um, it, it, it spans everything about C. elegans from you know the individual ion channels to the muscles to you know the skeletal uh, uh, text to to the what the neurons are doing, all the way to the behavior of the of the of the worms, and so I'm working with with Open Worm um, to help them validate uh, some layers of, of their model as well. So that for examples going forward. So here's an example. So the worm is called channel worm. It's for um, uh, ion channel models that go into some of the, the cells in the worm. And you can see here, there's a highlighted a dot .sci unit file in our repository. That .sci unit file is a configuration file which um, basically, uh, it points to okay, where are the models and tests, and what should be tested. And, 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 and having done that, um, you can you can incorporate um, some, some variable commands into into continuous integration tools. That every time this model is changed, run all the tests again, and let show me how the model is doing. And simple, um, we use one really cool thing we can do is 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 have this IP generate this notebook. So if you've ever used uh, it's basically a successor to the IPython notebook. 
it's a cool uh, uh, code uh, way to 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 uh, both to code, but also to have a, a record of what you've done, which I think is sort of the most important thing. To have a record of, of what you've done in the US or to the model. And here's an example of just a cell from that notebook uh, automatically generated, which says um, uh, basically to 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 test the particular ion channel called EGL19 against uh, a particular piece of data, which is, in this case is a, is a current voltage relationship. And this, um, the prediction, as you can see, you know, doesn't really match the observation all that well. And in this particular case, we consider that to be a, a failure of the model. So it's supposed to fail, and it would appear in a, in a, a dashboard as, as an example of a third that the modeler can then go back and revisit and sort of try to refine the model upon. Okay. If you may disagree with how the test was done, if you if you do, you can always go back and fork the repository, changes to the test, and recommit and have all this run again. You can see how your version does. And then we can uh, go through you know GitHub issues or, or offline or however and, and try to resolve those agreements or maybe we just end up with different sets of tests and because we don't agree that's okay. Uh, the, the you know based on GitHub gives us a lot of a lot of so you know the model is updated. Um, that's a run. The results are stored and visualized, and the uh, performance of the model is is summarized. And here's just an example of, a, of, a, of a, another self notebook. It's a sortable search table. Our uh, different model parameters in this case, uh, are given in, in rows, and different tasks are given in columns, and different kinds of so between model and data values. Um, is, is is provided and color coded according to how well did. So red maybe is, is more we need to really to take a closer look at it. Uh, it integrates with with tools like uh, like Travis CI. So so uh, you can have these sit run every single time a bit or a change is made to the model. And not only will the model be tested for uh, classical unit tests that verify that the model the basic model is running and it's simulating. Um, so uh, generate all these these outputs. Uh, these, these classical uh, tables that show you not only how the model is doing, but give you some specific details like plotting individual, you know, IV curves. And I uh, know that is dumped into, into uh, Amazon S3 buckets. You can go look at any time, see the state of the model, and see the state of the model performance. Um, uh, this slide here. here uh, the benefits of incorporating this workflow. You can it's important to know what your model can and can't do. And this is a very transparent way to see yeah, uh, continuously to test it because you know uh, as you're 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 developing the model, sometimes you know the model gets worse in some aspects, and you're able to catch that you know right away. Uh, you want to be able to say that your model is the best. You want to in review say you know that that your model passes the following metrics, um, and you know if your model is published. You want to be able to continue to test the model because new is going to come out after your model is published. And it'd be good to be able to continue to test the model against that to see if your model is still relevant or further improvement is needed. Because usually further improvement is always is needed in almost any model. Um, and for an experimentalist, it, you can really put observations in context. When you that, that corresponds to your data, you can run a test on a bunch of different models and see, okay, which is the model that actually is able to, to reproduce this data or to, to match this data. And then you give a sense of, of what the model you might I want to work with going forward when you can make sense of the experiments that you're doing. Okay. Um, I think you know in, when we write grants, we 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 write hypotheses and we think about okay, well if if A turned out to be true, what would the implications be? Or if not A turned out to be true, what would those implications be? You can actually so do that all before you actually do the experiments by encoding the theoretical results of the experiments into tests and running them on an existing models. I think it would be a really powerful way to make, make various hypotheses about which models uh, would be validated or, or refuted by, by particular experimental results. Um, so this, this is an example of that. Um, yeah, you want your experiment to be something that you're aware of. And people are likely more excited about it if, if your experiment is the kind of thing that can uh, result between competing models. Uh, so that, those are all really great things to have. Um, so the last plug, uh, SciUnit is this, this is this overall overarching framework for for investing in science with data. And NeuroUnit is a specific implementation of it in neuroscience. There could be other implementations. 
that require domain knowledge that I don't necessarily have. For example, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a uh, cell biologist. I'm not uh, uh, understands a lot about, uh, uh, you know, genomics or 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 uh, behavior. Uh, and those are things that could uh, that that you could have alternative you know, unit testing uh, uh, libraries for uh, their own unit, you know. Uh, in, in your own your own discipline, add unit to it, and that could be a, a science uh, a library. Uh, or to any questions that might uh, have come up in the, in the meantime. Hello? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm all I'm all done with this part. Um, if uh, Port would like to. Um, or if anyone has any questions in the meantime. So Rick, I have a question while Parag switch over. Is just um, do you have an idea of of how the neuroscience community using the, the patches that you've talked about? Um, now um it's And then a few others. So for, I give an example of uh, blue, blue Brain. So uh, uh, Andrew Davison, who is now in charge of sort of motivation for, for cells and Blue Brain, uh, is contacting me to to be working uh, more closely on that. Uh, some of the people who are doing uh, hippocampal cell models were already using it. Um, it's been used for some olfactory models, um, and I know most of those people. Uh, and then and then I'm you know working uh, on trying to get Every model that's in, 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 in or every well curated model in open source brain uh, uh, tested uh, as well. So right now it's it's um, compared to what Porg is talking about, this is a very immature project, um, still in, in, in the early stages. Uh, there's you know a, 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 say a dozen p other people that are that are currently uh, um, you know, using that. Rick Gray, you had a comment on the chat box. Did you want to voice it? Also, save it to the end. Yeah, I, I can say something about that now. So right now, you know, neuromel is, is a standard in you know neuron for neuro neuron models um, and and, and neuron models. Uh, we would extend beyond that. In fact. Uh, one of our first maybe efforts to do that would be to to look at markup languages that, that generally cover um, translations in general. So like uh, set ML is something that could maybe cover a lot of areas, including neuroscience. Um, if I were a cell biologist and I want to make you know cell unit or whatever it is that that, that cell biologists want to 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 test the models, then cell ML is something that that I would I would probably um, uh, be be looking into. The reason we use because it covers a lot of very neuroscience specific things that, that are not uh, and, uh, are just to people who don't study neurons. Great now? Yeah. Great. I a few things. So great, uh, great presentation. Um, I'll try and find a, a link here to a recent paper that goes into the different markup languages for simulations. Um, there's, a, there's one for systems biology and a few other ones. So I'll send that out. I think it'll be of interest to you all. And the cell has been very good for us. There's, you know, now papers that uh, do functional curation, so through a variety of models and, and do the same different protocols. And um, a few of us have published papers on those. So maybe I'll just send a few links if, if you guys are interested um, as, as you move forward. Yeah, thank you. Yep. And I gross. Did you want to voice your question now? Mute yourself. Lou and about the use of other standard methods for model evaluation. Um, well, if Lou can't talk now, we can just go ahead and, and go to Parag's uh, portion of the talk. I, 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 just, uh, I don't know. If, Lou, feel free to interrupt me if you are able to unmute yourself. Um, uh, so for standard methods, in, in methods that one would 
would do to compare your uh, data. Yes. Oh, I'm Hello? In, in, in side unit, um, a lot of you input a lot of um, sort of standard uh, way to do a uh, comparison of, 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 of facts about models and, and data. And, and that's something that the, the, the person on the test um, is free to choose which of those that they want to include. I'm, I'm continuing adding more. Um, some of them are, uh, are sort of represent the level of, of the final score. For example, do you want to have you know, a pass-fail test or do you want to have something that represents uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 implementation of the of, of the computer, what the metric you're using to even do the comparison. Uh, so those uh, we have implemented as well, and are continuing to implement more. I'm happy to to do, uh, especially those in use in, in neurophysiology. So happy to continue to, to add add more. Okay, and um, Rick Gray just posted the link to the, the paper he referred to in his comments about standards and software. So click on the chat box link that Rick Gray sent, you'll find the paper. So I'll um, go ahead and then, Parag, you can go on with your portion of the talk. How about that? Okay, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yeah. fine. Okay, great. Um, so um, thanks to uh, Rick and Grace uh, for uh, in Invited me to speak here. I'm going to speak a little bit about open source brain, uh, and this is the um, platform that uh, Rick has already mentioned uh, briefly uh, for, uh, which is attempting to enable sharing and collaborative development of models in computational neuroscience. Now, um, probably there's a lot of people here not in neuroscience, but um, you may recognize this uh, general uh, model development lifestyle going from uh, the experiments in lab. Uh, uh, the um, uh, logical system of your uh, choice results, and then um, implementing this model uh, in the simulator of your choice, doing it, cleaning up the code, and actually publishing the model. This whole uh, um, stage of uh, models can easily take two years in neuroscience and probably something similar in their fields. Um, but ideally, at, the, at this end point here, uh, the model will publish, the code will be out there, um, it'll be in hopefully a public repository, a model DB in. Um, uh, New Science is a very popular repository for archiving these models, and that's great. Um, it's out there, the code is out there, um, but the only thing that happens then is it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop at the point of publishing. Um, we've actually published this um, quite lightly. They'll have found bugs, they'll have uh, made updates, they'll have uh, incorporated new experimental results. They're updating their local copy of this model. Um, People could download the paper, download the model, make independent changes uh, in the code itself, uh, and other people look at the paper, decide that the uh, code that or the simulator that's being used to encapsulate the model, um, not their simulator of choice, might prefer a different language, and they start from scratch. So either there is a publication, even though it's a very useful and valuable uh, model in, in the community, all these different strands of updates. Um, uh, kind of lost when you actually go to the model archive, download this, and uh, try to use the model. So what we do is try to improve this uh, process, try to, um, yeah, get uh, this sh sh modeling process um, a more scientific. Uh, first step um, in that is uh, reproducibility. This is a Kinani kind of uh, model sharing initiative, being able to download, being able to reproduce the um, a uh, question across a different a range of different simulators and a range of different uh, platforms. Um, um also an imp important point. Um, it's not just getting the um, code, being able to get the C++ or MATLAB. It would be good to also have uh, it easier to access and look at the internal parameters of that file, maybe make some model, make some changes, um, and probe the internal um, uh, parameter of the model. Portable, as I mentioned, um, get not restricting to the original um, uh, language or platform that the model was developed in, but being able to run it across different platforms would uh, imp uh, the accessibility of the model and transparency. Um, probe deeper inside the model, being able to uh, ask 
where different parameters in the model actually came from, all aspects would uh, make these models much more usable and ultimately oops, um, make the of computational uh, neuroscience more scientifically rigorous. So in contrast with the case where you just get tens and lines of Fortran code, um, if you actually get access to all of those uh, parameters in the model and get in uh, from the structure of the model, it would be much more usable. Uh, we set up the open source brain repository. It's at open source brain org. And the idea here is to make um, yeah, this modeling much more accessible. Um, it's uh, funded by the Wellcome Trust um, and is uh, open source model development repository of computational neuroscience. And it's a database of spiking neuron and network models in standardized format. So I'll say a bit more about these standardized formats. Rick already mentioned them. Um, but we want to uh, try to get people to use uh, these common uh, computational neuroscience standards. More than anything else, uh, we want to invite people to comment on, extend, reuse models, and run them across multiple sectors. So we want to make this um, a collaboration platform where users get together. It's just that somebody uploads a model and uh, hopefully other people use it. Uh, we want people to collaborate and work together to make these models better. So for actually how to uh, develop complex um, um, packs, all these have been solved in the open source software development community. So to like GitHub, uh, uh, processes like uh, version control, all of these uh, tools and best practices we're going to be using uh, for this um, initiative. So as an opportunity um, I outlined previously, uh, it is a lab which has developed uh, a nice computational model. It's version 1.0. That's great. Others are interested in it. Uh, so to uh, make a fork of this model, uh, introduce changes here. Other labs might come along and say, OK, well, this one updated version is much. I'll make some uh, modifications to that. I'll update the documentation. The good thing this open uh, doing this in a pub forum is that changes can eventually be merged back in. So if lab A is happy with these updates, incorporated into um, the um, history of the um, changes, uh, incorporate their own changes. And what, what, I, what you act up with here is a much better version of the model than the original one, which is published. And you can see all the different contributions by the parties uh, to this, this uh, the history of the model. Uh, to do with open source brain. So the structure we're trying to take is having uh, this central resource, opensourcebrain.org. Uh, the models themselves will live outside of this on uh, public repositories like GitHub. So the Verbellum and Cortex are being published on GitHub. Uh, it could be a lab zone uh, repository. But what OpenSoin will do is uh, provide a forum for actually finding these models, indexing them, but also extra tools like visualization, analysis of the structures, and so on. Um, of a tip project on Open Source Brain, this is one of uh, a core network. Again, the structure of the model is not really important. It's model uh, neurons in a uh, cortical column. And this has been developed over a number of years. Uh, it was originally developed in Fortran. And what you have here in this open source project is all the different people from different countries who are interested in moving the model forward. As I say, it was originally developed in Fortran. The original code can be found in this model DB repository. You have links here to some details about the contents of the model. Um, and you want to uh, the GitHub repository associated with this. So behind the scenes, there's this public repository in GitHub. You have Fortran versions of the models. You have the ML version of the model here. And all of this can be downloaded. And with GitHub, the big advantage is you can see all the different uh, parties who are contributing to this model. And different changes have been made. I mean, there's a number of PhD students, master's students, students have contributed to the uh, over the years. So back on our brain, uh, there's a direct link to the uh, GitHub repository. So we can find all the uh, NeuroML files, which, which are on that uh, GitHub repository and in this standardized format. Because we've managed to convert them to the standardized format, we uh, bring them into the open source brain repository and visualize them in our, our, on our site. So this is um, the same project again. You've seen one of the network models from here. Um, and what you're seeing in this view is um, the network model has been brought in 
and this is again within a standard browser um, it's showing you the structure of a number of the cells within the network this is five populations from a, a cortical model uh, uh, cells pyramidal cells um, about 60 cells in total uh, visualized in 3D, you can extract information on the numbers of cells in each of the populations, uh, the types of cells, as I say, basket cells, uh, interneurons, and um, regular spiking cells. So all of this information is extracted from uh, neural files, which have been found on GitHub. So information on ion channels present in the cells, the type of synapses that are out. Um, all of this can be um, shown in the browser. In the browser. So one here is selecting uh, one particular cell type, uh, ion chat type, and highlighting in red and yellow on the um, cells are where these ion channels are, are found, the membranes. Um, and it can be more easily related to uh, what a, an experimentalist will know from um, ion channel expression in uh, different types. Um, the ion channels themselves uh, have um, and as you can see here, and you can extract um, expressions uh, from these structural ML models uh, for uh, activation and inactivation uh, rates um, for particular channels. So again, you should look at any of the XML that uh, the original format that's uh, stored in. All this is automatically translated to a uh, much more accessible view for experimenters and other interested parties. What I'm doing now is um, <clears throat> visual structure of the network. So various options for looking at the structure of the connections in the network. And here just uh, shows a matrix of uh, connectivity. And between the five different cell groups, there's multiple types of, of X3 inhibitory uh, connections. And again, um, it's a little bit easier to see the um, projections, the synaptic projections between the um, deflations of neurons. And there's a slightly different way of viewing this. Actually, you select one of the points on the uh, matrix. You can see the specific pair of connections, specific pair of cells that are connected. The green uh, options for uh, different views on the network connectivity here. Again, these five populations, there's multiple projections between these uh, parameters. Um, uh, uh, this one, uh, uh, superflexonic cell, cells, and again, again, there's views that you can be all, can be automatically generated to uh, so the types of connections you believe are present in the network are actually there. So this is nothing specific for cortical networks. Um, it could be uh, done for any. Um, Network that's expressed on a GitHub repository in NeuroML. So there are multiple um, ways that uh, people uh, can express models in neuroscience. So from integrate and fire neurons to uh, compartments to some abstract morphology, as I showed, to detailed morphologies. And there's different levels of uh, network uh, that can um, uh, be incorporated into models. So from single cells up to hundreds and thousands of cells. So he shows, just shows some of the examples from the neocortex that are present already on open source brain, uh, ranging from point neuron models up to uh, the Blue Brain project, uh, Henry Markram, uh, very detailed cortical call model. Uh, here's some from the cerebellum, the hippocampus, olfactory bulb, and input model. So this just demonstrates that there's a multiple uh, different regions covered on open source brain at the moment, and these neuromel and can be visualized as shown in the last slide. Indications of um, an octree bulb model, a hippocampal model, uh, the cortical model that I showed, uh, and cerebral network model that's uh, under development as well. So also just taken the screenshots from a standard browser. The technology that uh, underlies this, as I mentioned, is NeuroML. So again, this is a standardized XML language for computational neuroscience. And what can be expressed in this language is the standard um, contents of detailed uh, models in neuroscience, so neuronal morphologies, on channels, synapses, and there's a number of um, tools that started developing for NeuroML over the last number of years, including 
uh, Genesis um, standardal um, symmetries uh, to um, tools generating morphologies. So, for example, the trees toolbox and new gen are, can generate um, uh, new neuron, uh, neurons from uh, uh, various rules, biologically inspired rules. Uh, projects like Openworm and uh, Bluebrain Project, uh, uh, the um, used by those um, initiatives, they're also uh, supporting NeuroML. So it's becoming more widely accepted within the community. And this just shows some of the um, structure of NeuroML. There's, um, it covers uh, from cell morphology to networks, uh, different types of synapses, uh, inputs into networks, and different cell types. And the information uh, on NeuroML is available on the website. The specifications and examples if you want to look at how to uh, start converting models into so one other example on open source brain. The other advantages of having um, uh, models in a standardized format is it makes it much easier to combine these into uh, more complex models. So the model I'm just about to show uh, t has taken an example of a pyramidal cell from the Blue Brain project. So again, from that detailed cortical column uh, model, uh, um, it's taken um, a pyramidal cell. Uh, uh, a number of uh, single uh, compartment um, Hodgkin Huxley based um, mod, uh, which are based on data from the Allen Institute uh, cell types database. So, this is recorded from the visual cortex in mouse. And we've um, incorporated a network structure uh, of um, GreenNet 2000, which is a set of excitatory and, inhi and inhibitory cells. So, balance of excitation and inhibition within this network network leads to um, uh, various different types of spiking behavior in the network. So these have been um, uh, expressed in NeuroML and uh, can be incorporated into uh, a composite model, showing more of the details of um, uh, and the capabilities of NeuroML. So here's the model, so tails uh, pyramidal cell model at the center there, uh, the cell models that are on the outside here, 80 cells of one, 40 cells of another, I think from um, uh, principles and an, an iron from the Allen Institute uh, data, um, and as you can see here, you can uh, select in selecting the um, ion channel density uh, across the morphology um, uh, of the cell. And is the uh, structure of the connectivity in the network. This is a large number of connections between the um, excited inhibitory cells, so the uh, light and dark blue. Uh, there's a huge number of connections there, and there's a by the background of um, input into the um, uh, process cell. So as I say, the um, uh, ground excitation for this um, uh, cell, cell model will come from the interactions with these um, point neurons around it. So if we actually run a simulation with, with this, uh, there's a button on the Open interface for actually converting the NeuroML file into something that can be simulated. So if you run, you can uh, select, recall membrane potentials, record all uh, membrane potentials at the soma. And what happened with this model is that the NeuroML will be converted into a form which can uh, um, sit in one of the standard simulators. And this is the neuron simulator uh, we, uh, Rick mentioned earlier. And uh, what happens here is there the um, Simulated, and this is all through the browser. You can open up the experiments tab and see if the um, experiment is completed. Uh, it's recorded 100 variables. Uh, these variables have been recorded the background cells, as well as all of the compartments in the uh, detail model. And, uh, this will also allow you to do else, but also replay the simulation. Uh, overlaid on the uh, 3D model that's uh, shown. It's just plotting a number of the uh, uh, Bachkin Huxley cells and the number of points in the layer 2 cell. And just running a, a very brief mission. It's just loading the results now. Uh, it should display. So on the top uh, is the advanced, uh, excitatory, uh, three of the excitatory background cells. And on the bottom, uh, two locations on the uh, layer two, three pyramidal cell. So again, all of this is uh, the similar set running through the reserve, converted to neuron, 
um, and the results saved and can be accessed through the browser. So the other here is that um, uh, you can apply the recorded membrane potentials to the cell and read the mission. And now is the um, membrane potential um, visualized on the cell morphology. So point here, you can uh, hold simulation slightly faster and uh, excitation from the uh, cells. And what happens is that uh, they exit the um, L3 cell, and you can do simulation in and visualize um, the occasion, for example, where the um, uh, potential begins. So it's going to um, open up the soma of the uh, cell. And um, when the back cells start to spike, the cell. The spreading out from the soma and pause the simulation, uh, zoom in, and um, get a better feel for how action potentials propagate in these detailed cell models. Okay, uh, so that's the core functionality of Open Source Brain: uh, visualizing these uh, cell models, uh, replaying simulations, uh, um, make changes to the structure of the simulations, um, and yes. Uh, one new feature we've added recently is um, integration with the Neuroscience Gateway. Now, this is a, a portal, um, uh, a science portal based in uh, uh, which allows access to supercomputing resources for the neuroscience community. And what we've done is uh, add the ability on open source brains. So you can see here, uh, run neuron on NSG. And what we'll actually do is um, in generating the model, running it on our server. It will zip it up, send it to the uh, supercomputing resources in San Diego. You can run models on single processors, multi-processors, and all of this uh, just through logging into the uh, open source brain website, uh, setting up your simulation, and you can start uh, um, simulations in this way and just visualize it in your browser, download the results, and actually make it, makes it much more accessible for the wider neuroscience community. Okay, so each of the projects on Open Source Brain. If you go to a project, you might see this button here, which will lead you to the um, Travis uh, website. And Rick Mend uh, we've got uh, these continuous integration uh, type tests. So we have this uh, system already for Open Source Brain. We haven't yet uh, extended it to uh, use units and new units. But even the models on Open Source Brain, when you make a, a change to the model, when you commit a change, uh, it say it runs tests, it runs, makes sure that uh, the neural is valid, it can be run on across multiple simulators, and that uh, roughly produce the expected behavior. Uh, this will be extended with um, uh, even more detail for a uh, neuron, neuron unit and psi unit, so that you have a better model on the exact um, uh, validity of each of these models that's uh, uh, running. The final point uh, that I wanted to mention was uh, the uh, Open Worm project. Uh, Rick mentioned it. Uh, um, one of the I'll go into it in too much detail, except to say that it's using the it's the to uh, sit uh, C elegans uh, round worm and try to make a computational model which incorporates as much physical detail and that um, as possible to make a, a full cell um, model of a full nervous system and the body of Open Worm. And this here is uh, just demonstrating uh, a benefit we from using uh, open source tools. The same visualization platform that we're using for open source brain is being used in the uh, Open Worm project and the visualization of the um, worm relation and activity of a number of muscles in this uh, platform here. And yeah, so they make, make the point that um, uh, because we're uh, developing these tools in a collaborative manner, Manner because we're using open standards. Uh, this here, which is in NeuroML, can be visualized on the same platform and have benefits for both communities. Both the open source brain and open worm can benefit from uh, um, progress in each project. Okay, so um, open source brain is hosting a, a large um, range of uh, models from multiple different regions. Uh, NeuroML 2 to um, 
uh, much easier to visualize, to simulate these models through the open source brain website. Um, the tools uh, we've developed are ready for collaborative development, ready for input from the community, increasing the um, reproducibility, accessibility, portability, uh, uh, transparency of these scientific models uh, to make them more, uh, make them of better quality for the wider community, and um, hopefully make them have people to use to gain insight into the uh, biological function of the systems being modeled. So with that, I'd like to say thanks. And if anybody has any questions, um, um, I'd be glad. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. We'll open up um, the webinar to open questions and comments. And if you can, please share all your faces. So Lou Gross, if you're still on the line, if you can use your mic, um, you you put up meant uh, a Yeah. Can, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank yes. you. Great. Um, uh, so uh, I'm I'm coming from a perspective as a mathematician who works in completely different areas. In this case, ecology and environmental fields. Um, and and I guess my general comment is that that of what has been discussed in models as code. And for many of us, the model is not the code. It is the assumptions underlying what the implementation is, which is, in our case, might be mathematical rather than purely in code. Um, and, and so I have a question specifically for Rick. Um, the, one of the standard approaches to model um, evaluation is uh, methods of certainty analysis, uh, structural stability of the model, as well as sensitivity analysis. And my question is whether people have developed unit tests to essentially carry out these kinds of um, structural analysis. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. So that's your second question first. So um, I, you know, work with main collaborators at, at uh, Math. Some issues, uh, you know, uh, the issues, and one thing we're is to have tests which are not tests of disagree with the data, but does this have the following dynamic systems properties that you might be interested in? So let's say the test is, you know, okay, so in, 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 in physiology, for example, so you have type 1 versus type 2 firing rate, uh, threshold firing rate dynamics, which is really just has to do with, you know, what, uh, what the, the bifurcation looks like at, in, 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 uh, as you change, uh, as you change uh, certain, certain membrane uh, parameters. And so you have a test that says, is it this or is it this? And you one of them is the one you're looking for. Um, that's, that's an example where it's not so much as of, of I didn't agree with this particular experiment, but it's properties which are properly observed by executing the model, um, but as opposed to sort of doing what abstracts, which would be getting closer to the things you're interested in. Um, I would say generally the strength of this approach is that what I'm what I'm working on is is, is focusing on 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 Mobile, uh, agreement with with data. So I, I guess um, uh, publication is a great system for for driving the things the more interested in the model. I think it's it's one where publishing is it's very successful in uh, driving the insights of the model or the or the structure of the model or the uh, uh, what the fundamental concept is. On that, for those who are interested in, okay, let's describe um, the out there we can measure. Does it those measurements? That's that's what I'm interested in, in doing in, in work, which which isn't necessarily you know is who are two different ideas. And I appreciate the challenges in in um, in that a model is consistent with available data, uh, but. And that doesn't mean that the underlying mechanisms included in the model are ones driving the data. There could be multiple mechanisms. Well, it could as be you, multiple as ones. You know. In fact, 
it, it, you could have a suite, a large suite of tests. You could have a large number of models that all get, you know, passed with flying colors. Right. And when you're, you're, you're generally what I found is that that's usually not the case. Once you, you, you know, most people agree this is good. They, uh, you start to have models that show, start to show weaknesses that we're not simply from the published uh, figures that were in, in the papers associated with the models. Because those the types of things the modelers were often thinking about are, um, are data they might have been thinking about they were trying to model are well modeled by the data, but some data they weren't thinking about turns out not to be. And so, so this is a way of sort of testing whether the scope of the model is limited to the data the model is thinking about the time or whether there are, there are other kinds of data that people weren't about that also, you know, they're initially are captured by the model as well. No, th thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, maybe if I can just add to that, um, I think both of these here are, are quite important from when you go to a point where you can write down a model uh, on a single sheet of paper, you can hold the, all the equations in your head, you can hold all the assumptions in your head, yet yeah, those models are very useful and very, very um, yeah, but once it gets beyond a level of complexity, you need to have some sort of ways to ensure that uh, the model reproduces what it originally said it would. Uh, the model can be used um, on different um, uh, departments. Uh, it applies with certain different uh, piece of data. If simple enough, you can probably think about the model, think about the structure of the model, and, and know that it will uh, have certain properties. But you need to get to a point where you, you can were so complex that um, you, you can ask about these in an automated way. You can ask whether it's a good quality model, whether it's structurally valid, whether it's according to certain data. And I think some of these initiatives are moving to where make those more complex models are use valid and um, uh, can be tested or that they're useful scientific uh, entities. Bill Cannon, you had a comment to make on this presentation? Make your comment. Bill Cannon, you. Just to the mic. Make ready. Right. So figuring out his mic, um, I'll just read his comment from the chat box. I think he was asking actually Lou, and I think you're talking about the model of the physics more or less, the models of different processes as well as, as the same physical model. I use the, the word physics loosely in this case. So you got your mic to work? You want to add to that? Hear you. you. You may want to try your phone to call in. You just um, hit so the second um, and you can call in if you'd like. So I don't know if Rick and do you want to comment on on Bill's comment there? Um, I guess I would. I'd like to hear. Question that I don't know if it's a question for me or not, but um, if it is, as I would elaborate it in text or, or voice. Hello? 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 We can you now. Oh, okay. You know, my question is I think I understand what you're asking that, that um, the phenomenon that they are modeling could be. Entirely captured in code, but I mean, it, it seems like what we capture in code is the mathematics of, of I believe nature works, basically the physics, and that the model of a, a neuron firing or of a cell's metabolism is often encoded in the parameters that go that are for the simulation. So I wasn't quite clear about. Your question, were you making a distinction of those two? Could 
Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's fine. Yes. Okay. Um, so when I think about code, uh, generally the code does not include within it what the underlying assumptions are. So, for example, key issues of what the time and space scale are uh, may be incorporated in the uh, better definitions of the, the time and, and so on uh, associated with the units of the parameters. But um, I, I, I guess I, I really am concerned about the code documentation is sufficiently incorporating the key assumptions in the model. And it goes for complex models as well as simplified ones. And, and it seems as if the process that Richters have described here is a process to enhance the quality of the documentation as well as the ability to assess the model with regard to unit tests and other tests. And so I want to applaud the effort to make more clear what the key assumptions are in a uh, model as encoded within the metadata structure of the model itself. You agree? I think, I think um, the kind of things you need to do to make your models ready to test are basically to, well, one way is to use certain standards that happens when it happens almost automatically. Um, and, or the other is to, to um, refactor the implementation model in a way that very clearly exposes what the interfaces are between the model and, 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 you know, and the experimenter or between you know, the, the, the different, what the parts of the model are, what the model can do. Right. Um, so in other words, if you know if, if a, a spaghetti code is, is very difficult to test, it's also very difficult to understand what's going on, what 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 the model is trying to do. And so by by the way where where the your interest makes it much easier to test it as well. Um, and and just a, another point that often the models are not very clear right front as to what the evaluation criteria are for assessing them. Uh, this, this goes for simple models as well as complicated ones. And it may be very difficult to expose what those criteria are uh, from the start. But I would argue uh, that specifying the evaluation criteria as part of the objective of doing the model in the first place is, uh, is really, really important. Test-driven development is a concept in, in, in software development that you subjective by writing the test the pro project is more or less complete. And I think it's ambitious for, for, for science, but I mean, you can imagine something like that, where there's a certain set of, of benchmarks that you want to hit. And with benchmarks, that's, you, that describes the model as being a success. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I mean. And unfortunately, much of the model publication literature does not even mention what the evaluation criteria are. I think, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just want to make a point. Uh, we might have a little bit of an unfair advantage in neuroscience, simply from the point of view or at the uh, types of models we're looking at, because there's agreement in the field of what's in front what's important a neuron, uh, its membrane potential, its spiking properties, uh, the structure of a network. So we kind of know in advance that ideally a model of a cortical network will have cells, will have certain properties. You can go into the lab and record things. So while a huge number of different types of models in neuroscience, um, there is um, a, a certain number of models which will be compared to one another, and you can make the assumptions about what it should do. You can get experimental data and have a look at experimental data, have a look at the model, and compare it with one and see whether it is actually um, applying to what you get out of the lab. Other fields, I'm sure, have much more difficulty actually hammering what's important, and different types of models will have different assumptions and will have capabilities. But I think here, there's a certain shared capabilities um, in neuroscience that um, we're kind of in our 
objectives. I think what we might also be referring to is evaluation of the model in terms of the ultimate use case for the end user who might be using or reusing your model for intended purpose of that user. And this is something that in our new IM, in our current IMAG funding opportunity, we have a little credibility plan where we're asking the modeler to lay out the metrics for evaluating a model uh, as a third party user. So to give the third party a more of an idea of a, a use case and evaluating the metrics of the model. I'm not sure, Lou, if that's what you're referring to as well. Um, I think that that's a perfect example, and I applaud you, Grace, for doing that. Well, we're still implementing it, so we'll see what happens in the consortium on how well people are actually implementing their model credibility plan. So. Uh, also, just in the chat box, if people are following Rick Gray before he left the call, also posted another link of uh, FDA guidelines for documenting models for medical device development, actually. So take a look at that document in terms of what the FDA is is, is asking for. Was that? Oh, um, I was going to ask. Uh, so you're having these uh, model uh, curly plans. Ability plans. Um, it's interesting in, and this is something that maybe goes back to you know debating at the time what the criteria are for determining whether the model is success or what it needs to have. Having some sort of Effort to collaboratively develop these kinds of things because one of the, the unit testing can be successful is um, when there's collaborative development of, of of what the test would be the criteria would be uh, uh, for judging the, uh, the model from from abstract uh, I'd like you know is uh, do we care about the spike rates of the model to the, to the, to the details of you know how exactly we're going to measure that and the details of how uh, what you know, algorithms are we going to use to 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 compare between model and data? Um, that I have found that with very little community input, um, with very little formal community input. So so you know, I actually ask people, and, and every neurophysiologist's opinion in terms of but it, but there's which there's not uh, people are together and 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 setting your beat. Software, just strictly a software question. That, that's a question you'd want to answer. Either we're doing all of your model checks by hand, right? And so um, I, I would be interested, I guess, in seeing you know, agencies um, get behind. That. I think it also helped to, to to have a clear set of criteria. When, when when someone submits a paper for peer review, you could say, well, did you look at these criteria and whether your model is is you know valid or important or whatever. Glad you brought that up. I'll take this opportunity to make a special plug for our 10th anniversary multi-scale modeling consortium meeting, which is March 22nd, 23rd, and 24th here at the NIH. And one of the requests from the multi-scale modeling PIs from IMAG initiatives is actually to have a discussion on implementing the model credibility plans and actually asking the, the very questions you just stated. How do you use community input to actually implement that process? Yeah, it could be. I mean, in terms of advising applicants when they're writing their grant applications for models, though, I mean, really, it's really up to each modeler to determine their criteria for the even of their use case. I mean, often the reason why people may not want to share their model is I know if the person I pass the model to will use it in the right way, understanding the assumptions that Lou just mentioned that aren't really necessarily transparent and properly use the model as it was intended. So uh, that's sort of where we're going in terms of the first steps towards actually model sharing is to get people to be confused with their model in the first place. Lou, I, I just, I really appreciate that comment. And it's one reason why I, so, uh, uh keys I've been on, including a National Academy one, uh, Decided not to use the term validation at all in talking about models. I'm very careful in, in using the term evaluation because the term validation means very different things in very different scientific communities. 
and we worry a good deal about people taking a model that is claimed to be valid and using it for purposes which it was never uh, intended to be used. Right. I think that's why we actually, within the multi-scale modeling consortium, we have this the uh, credible model committee that created the guidelines for credible use of models, and, and they kind of away from the terms of balance verification just for the same reasons, and, and to talk about model credibility as a, as a starting point. Other comments, questions? So this webinar, let's give our speakers a virtual hand. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Rick and Farag.